from Brunei Darussalam, also known as the Abode of Peace. We are excited to learn and grow with our fellow delegates and to connect with a much more nuanced understanding of the ASEAN-Indian relations so that we, the young people, can help achieve our nation's vision, the ASEAN community vision, and the sustainable development goals. Like many other countries, Brunei has experienced many eras of development that has helped Brunei be the, and be the, the country it is today. After gaining our independence on the 1st January 1984, we have henceforth celebrated our Independence Day on the 23rd of February at the capital city, Bandar Seri Begawan. Shortly after attaining full independence, we became a member of the ASEAN community on the 7th of January 1984 to strengthen bonds and help build the ASEAN community for our current and future generations. To further this endeavor, bilateral relations between Brunei and India were established. We only have a population of less than half a million, around 400,000, with us being located on the third largest island, Borneo. We have four districts, which will take you only approximately three hours from one end of Brunei to the other, with Brunei Mora being the most densely populated. Okay, so culture is a big aspect in every country, but in Brunei there's MIB, which is the Melayu Islam Braja. MIB is the national philosophy of Brunei Darussalam. It is described as a blend of Malay language, culture and costume, the teaching of Islamic laws and values, and the monarchy system, which must be esteemed and practiced by all. We have seven ethnic, uh, Melayu Brunei, Melayu Kedayan, Melayu Tutong, uh, I'm sorry, uh, seven ethnic, Melayu Brunei, Melayu Kedayan, Melayu Tutong, Melayu Belait, Melayu Murut, Melayu Dusun, and Melayu Bisaya. Um, the, the costume that we are wearing right now is uh, our na Malay national costume uh, for, the, for the guys. Uh, it is called Baju Cara Melayu, which uh, I'm wearing right now. And for the girls, uh, it's called Baju Kuro. So, um, Islam is our official religion, but other religions are also present, such as Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, and others. While Braja, it means that the country are run by the absolute monarchy, by our king. So, Brunei GDP is at 12 million, which consists of oil and gas industry, which is 90% uh, of our uh, Brunei revenue, non-oil and gas industry, service industry, and agriculture, forestry, and fishery. F forest, forestry and fishery. However, Brunei is in the face of diversifying our, economics, our economy, such as in agriculture, we are working together with Thailand to make our own breed of rice. Brunei are also looking into being the world halal hub, especially to countries like uh, countries like Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, Singapore, and other more. So currently, Brunei ranked the 55th in the ease of doing business. We improved from, from being the 134 as of now. We also have a body established by the Brunei government, which is called the Darussalam Enterprise to help SMSEs and businesses in Brunei to grow and penetrate into the international market. So uh, like recently, Darussalam Enterprise has worked together with Golden Equator from Singapore in securing 100,000 US dollar investment for the business startup. And uh, tourism in Brunei, we are famous, Brunei is famous for Kampung Air, the largest water village in the world. It is also known as Venice of the East. The residents of Brunei originally settled here, but uh, now they are moving to, uh, to the land. While uh, in the picture is uh, Soas Mosque, uh, 
it is actually Sultan Omar Ali Saifuddin Mosque, one of the main attractions in Brunei, and it was designed by our 28th Sultan, who was known as the modern architect of Brunei. And as you can see from the slides, uh, this is our traditional food. It's called ambuyat. Basically, it's made from a uh, sagu tree and then uh, crushed into sagu powder. And then you mix it with hot water. And then it becomes something like glue. And you will eat it with a <laughs> special sauce. And also, uh, we have some traditional game, such as pasang and also chongka, and also gasing. So um, we are just gonna uh, we are gonna show you a little bit uh, video uh, to show uh, about Brunei. So please enjoy. With that, we hope 
we showed you a glimpse of Brunei. Thank you very much from delegation of Brunei Darussalam. Please come to Brunei. Thank you very much. A big round of applause for this wonderful presentation by Brunei delegates. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would request the delegates from Cambodia to make their presentation. Good morning, His Excellency, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Today, on behalf of the delegation of Cambodia, I have the pleasure to present to all of you the brief introduction of Cambodia. Cambodia is located in Southeast Asia, bordering Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, and Gulf of Thailand. The capital city is Phnom Penh. Cambodia's total land size is 181,035 square kilometer with its population of around 15 million people. Cambodia is a tropical monsoon country which has two seasons all year round, dry season and rainy season. Cambodia is a democracy and ruled by constitutional monarchy, legislative powers by shared by the executive and the bicameral parliament of Cambodia, which consists of the lower house, the national assembly, and the upper house. The Senate members of the 123-seat assembly by the elected through a system of proportional representation and serve for the maximum term of five years. The Senate has 61 seats, two of which are appointed by the king or two others by the National Assembly and the rest elected by the commune counsel counselor from 25 provinces of Cambodia. Senators serve six year term. The foreign relations of Cambodia are handled by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Cambodia is the member of the United Nations, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. It is member of the ASEAN Development Bank, ADB, ASEAN, and joined the WTO in 2004. In 2005, Cambodia attended the inaugural East Asia Summit in Malaysia. Cambodia has established diplomatic relations with numerous countries. The government reports 20 embassies in the country, including many of its ASEAN neighbors and those important players during the Paris Peace negotiation, including the US, Australia, Canada, China and the European Union, EU. Japan and Russia as the result of its international relation versus charitable organization has assisted with social, economic and civil infrastructure needs. The economy of Cambodia at present follow an open market system, market economy and has seen rapid economic progress in the last decade. Cambodia had a GDP of one, oh, 1805 billion in 2015. Cambodia's two largest industries are textile and tourism. While agriculture activities remain the main source of income for many Cambodians living in rural areas, the service sector is heavily concentrated on trading activities and catering related service. Thank 
Next, please. Throughout the past year, Cambodia has numerous major development of infrastructure to better connect the people and shorten travel time between one place to another for people needs and to boost both tourism and economy of the country. Cambodia has increasingly become involved in sport over the last 30 years. Football is popular as uh, martial arts in particular. Sepak Takra, which look like volleyball, is also a very popular sport in Cambodia. The martial arts of Bokata, Pradal Sirei, Khmer kickboxing, Khmer traditional wrestling are all practiced in the country. Various factors contribute to the Cambodian culture, including Theravada Buddhism, Hinduism, French colonialism, Angkorian culture, and modern globalization. The Cambodian Ministry of Culture and Fine Art is responsible for promoting and developing Cambodian culture. Cambodian culture not only include the culture of the lowland ethnic majority, but also some 20 culturally distinct hill tribe, colloquially known as Khmer Le. In Cambodia, tourism is the second largest income contributed to the Cambodian economy after the government industry. In 2017, income from tourism accounted for 3.6 billion or around 20% of Cambodia cross domestic product GDP. In 2018, we received more than 63 billion international tourists at an increased rate of 12% compared to 2017. Sorry, this is the, <laughs> the old uh, file. Uh, this has proven that Cambodia has a steady and sustainable growth number of tourists visiting Cambodia. Apart from the international tourists, we can witness a significant increasing of in internal tourists and outbound tourists as the country is experiencing the steady growing of middle class family from the peace, stability, safely, attractive product and economic development of the country. Currently, meeting with the demand about 48 airlines are currently having their operation here in Cambodia, served by three main international airports, Phnom Penh International Airport, Siem Reap International Airport, and Sihanouville International Airport. More local airlines is expected to be operated in the near future. Cambodia is also awarded as the number one, Uncle Wat, the very best of landmark by TripAdvisor. There are various gateways if you want to visit Cambodia, both by land and by air. We have three major international airports at Phnom Penh, Simriat, and Sihanoukville. To ease and welcome more tourists, Cambodia has an ease travel option to choose from all tourists are welcome to do e-visa or visa on arrival at our international airport and major checkpoint across the country. I am looking forward to welcome all of you to Cambodia soon. Thank you for your attention. We still have two minute times left in her presentation. So if any one of you has any question to ask, then uh, you are welcome. We still have two minutes time. Uh, no one? OK, then. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we will move to the third presentation. I uh, request the Indonesian delegate to please come on the dais and make, uh, make their presentation.
Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, the participants of the second ASEAN India Youth Summit 2019. Namaskar. Namaskar. Today, on behalf of Indonesia delegates, let us show you briefly about our country. My name is Sarah Panjaitan, and this is my friend. Putri Jasmine. So, Indonesia is a wealthy country. It is the largest archipelago in the world, range from Sabang in Aceh to Merauke in Papua. It has the largest economy in Southeast Asia and is one of the emerging market economies of the world. Our country is also a member of G20 and classified as a newly industrialized country. It is the 16th largest economy in the world by nominal GDP and the seventh largest in terms of GDP purchasing power parity. However, let us step aside from such serious topics like this and take you to some facts about Indonesia which we believe will be more interesting for you. Right, Sarah? Of course, Jasmine. Dear friends, Indonesia is a country full of diversity. If you look at our national emblem, Garuda, you will see the birds scroll scribbing a white ribbon, scroll inscribed with the national motto, Bineka Tunggal Ika, which can be loosely translated as unity in diversity. What makes Indonesia so diverse? Well, we have around 264 million population. This makes Indonesia the fourth largest country in the world. Moreover, there are around 300 ethnic groups and 742 local languages. So, you may wonder how we communicate each other with so many languages. Well, luckily, we have our national language, which is Indonesian language or Bahasa Indonesia. Now, let's take a look to our tourism sector. Tourism in Indonesia is an important component of the Indonesia economy. Indonesia was ranked at 20 in the world tourist industry in 2017. Also ranked as the ninth fastest growing tourist sector in the world, the third fastest growing in Asia, and also the fastest growing in Southeast Asia. Dear friends, both nature and culture are major components of Indonesia component. The natural heritage can boast a unique combination of a tropical climate, a vast archipelago of more than 70,000 islands, which 6,000 of them being inhabited. The second longest shoreline in the world, more than 54,000 kilometers after Canada. So Indonesia is the world's largest and most populous country situated on the Bazon Islands. The beaches in Bali, diving sites in Bunaken, Mount Bromo in East Java, Lake Toba in North Sumatra, and various national parks in the island are just a few examples of popular scenic destinations. These natural attractions are complemented by a rich cultural heritage that reflects Indonesia's dynamic history and ethnic diversity. The ancient Prambanan and Borobudur temples, Toraja, Yogyakarta, Minangkabau, and of course Bali, with its many Hindu festivals, are some of the popular destinations for cultural tourism. Speaking about Hindu, Indonesian archipelago was heavily influenced by Dharma civilization of India. For example, popular Indonesian Dangdut music displaying the influence of Hindustani music and it's very popular within the people of Indonesia. Indonesia's rich diversity extends beyond the people, culture, and ethnic cities. The sprawling archipelago is also home to a myriad of wildlife that will fascinate anyone. From birds to primates, discover also native animals you can only see in Indonesia, such as Komodo, Cendrawasi, Javan rhinoceros, Sumatran tigers, and also orangutan, etc. Nevertheless, most foreigners associate Indonesia with Bali, which is cool, right? But however, did you know Indonesia is more than just Bali? In fact, there are 10 new Bali you need to know, or better face it. The first one we have, Lake Toba. We call it the Caldera of Kings in North Sumatra. And next, there are Tanjung Lesum in the east part of Java. Next, we have Tanjung Selayang in Bangka Belitung. The next one is Mandalika, is the eastern part of Bali. The next one is Kepulauan Seribu, or we call it a thousand islands. The next is Borobudur Temple, which is the largest Buddhist temple in the world. 
The next is Labuan Bajo, also not from, from Mandalika. And the next is Wakatobi. It's, it's like, uh, which is like a beautiful sea of the tourism. And the last one, we have Morotai. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe five to 10 minutes presentation will never be enough to speak about Indonesia, even briefly. That's why we welcome you all to visit Indonesia and see the true beauty of our country. Thank, Thank you. you for your attention. Terima kasih. Donobot. Uh, we still have four minutes left, so if any one of you have some questions, uh, you can ask. Uh, yes. Hi. I really came to know about the 10 more uh, Bali in right. uh, Indonesia. So uh, what I want to ask you, I mean, uh, how do you think that uh, the cultural relation between uh, Indonesia and uh, India in next five years? And uh, how do you think that, uh, I mean, uh, I interacted with you that uh, you're from uh, I mean, uh, Bollywood. So how do you think that Bollywood can, uh, you know, uh, connect India and uh, Indonesia much more better? Mm -hmm. You have any idea? So actually, we have one friend that expert, and then I I think he can answer it. Please, Mr. Fausen. <laughs> Hi. Uh, bro. <laughs> so, uh, in terms of the connection between the cultural relations between India and Indonesia in terms of Bollywood, well, you see that uh, Bollywood is very popular in Indonesia. I'm also a fan of Bollywood, actually. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, both Indonesian and Indians actually love art, especially dancing and music. So, we can connect this uh, by exchange our culture. B uh, the thing is, we believe that uh, Indone Indian music is very common in our country, but not with Indonesian music. Uh, as you may have seen before, that our, one of our g genre, uh, dangdut, was influenced by Hindustani music. So actually, maybe we can take our, we can export our music to uh, India and see whether Indian also like this uh, or not. <laughs> if, if so, well, maybe we can, we can also export our uh, kind of entertainment too. And by the way, we have also uh, Sinetron. It's a kind of Bollywood, but not very Bollywood, but I think it's also our production. And <laughs> maybe uh, it's kind of opera soap, but uh, I believe we can have more to discuss about this. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now I would request the delegates from Lao PDR to come and make their presentation. and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Manna Seng, um, representative from the Lao PDR to present about the country profile. Right, so the presentations, we'll get through some of the uh, um, presenta presentation outlines at the country profiles, some of the uh, traditions, and also um, and also the brief of the economic development in Laos and also the Lao youth and contribution. Right, so we come up with the first one as the um, Laos. Uh, the Laos is located in the Southeast Asia, as you may know, and we share the border with five countries. So we share the border with China, um, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, 
And is this the only country in South Asia that is the landlocked country? So we don't have um, any connection to the sea. So the capital city of Laos is Vientiane, Vientiane. And we have 17 provinces. The population is around 7 million people. However, um, most of the people uh, in Laos are Buddhism, the Theravada Buddhism, as same as um, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, and Myanmar. And the official language is Lao. So um, Laos has many names, right? For example, like we call the Lao People Democratic Republic. In short, we call the Lao PDR, or Laos with S is a country, or the people that we call Laotians, and the language that we call Lao. So anyway, just call us Laos, it's fine. So we come up with the politico political structures. So we have the uh, structure of in terms of the, the president. Uh, at the moment, is His Excellency Bunyang Warajit. Uh, we have the president of the National Assembly of Her, Ex Her Excellency Spani Yatotu, and uh, the prime minister, His Excellency Tong Lun Si So uh, again, in the Southeast Asia, the only Laos that have the national uh, president of the National Assembly as a female. Come up with the people and culture and traditions. So um, even so, we have only seven million people, but we have more than uh, 149 subgroup of the ethnic group. So we classify into the three group, uh, three main group. Uh, we have the Lao Lum, Lao Sung, and Lao Teng. So um, this is some of the uh, traditional costume of the each of the ethnic group, for example, that you can see. And then you can see our ladies as well, that they, they wear the skirt, um, the Laos in all the time. And the other thing that's when we talk about the greeting in Laos, we call sabaydi, um, and then we nope, right? So uh, we do as the same as in Thailand, they call Y or Satu in Cambodia. So these are the same things. However, we have also the, some of the very unique traditions as well. For example, um, for, uh, for example, the uh, music instrument, for example, right? And also, next one is a, the festival of Laos. It's also come up from the uh, Buddhist, uh, the legion of the Buddhist, Buddhist as well. For example, the Lao New Year, that we have the uh, water festival in Thailand, uh, Cambodia, and Myanmar in the um, second week of April every year. The next one, some of the information about Lao is about the uh, national flower that we call the Dok Champa or the Frankie Pani. And um, another one is about the can. Can is a national instrument and it was endorsed as a tangible, uh, intangible heritage by the UNESCO in late 2017. So we move further uh, to the economic development of Lao. So um, the GDP is uh, pretty small comparing to other economics uh, in the regions. It's about uh, 16.5 billion US dollar, and the growth rate is below 7 percent. And the per capita income is about 2,500 US dollar a year. So um, the sector are mainly in the um, agriculture, services, and industry. So we look back at the import and export of Laos. So the trade partner, as you may see, like uh, Laos is a landlocked country, so we are more. I have the trade relations with our neighboring country. Um, so Thailand is the most country that imported the product from Laos, followed by China and Vietnam and some of other countries as well. For the export, um, we also export, uh, for the import, we import more product from Thailand. For the export as well, Thailand is still the major um, import country for Laos, uh, followed by the China and Vietnam. And uh, specifically, we talk about the Laos and India. We export the product to India around 2% of the total export. Laos is also try to promote the investment in many fields. Uh, so the investment from uh, 1988 to 2017, uh, the most investment are still from the neighboring country, is, which is the China, followed by Thailand, Vietnam, and some of the other uh, ASEAN countries as well. So um, the landlocked country is really hard for us uh, to export and then to improve the national economy as well. So what we try to do, the government has set the goal to link Laos with other ASEAN countries. So we try to change from the landlocked to be the landlinked country. So the map here uh, allows you to see some of the economic corridor that's going to link Laos with other countries in the region. For example, to China, to Vietnam, uh, to Thailand, Cambodia, and also Myanmar as well. So. Um, Myanmar, once we talk about the gateway to ASEAN, uh, Myanmar will be the, the first country that got to link India uh, and ASEAN together. Aside with the land link, the road link, we also said um, the government is trying to link uh, with other economies with the uh, real link through the real link as well. For example, like from Bangkok to the 
um, Wung Ang uh, port in Vietnam, for example, or from Kunming to Singapore through Laos, the real, the real road. <coughs> and uh, please allow me to brief you a little bit about the Lao Youth Union, uh, what we are coming here under the youth theme. So um, the Lao Youth Union is the um, organization uh, of the government that is rabbit in uh, on the 8, 8, uh, 14 of April in 1965. So the Lao Youth Union, we are taking care of uh, supporting and promoting the youth activity in contributing to the national development of Laos. And we have some of the uh, um, comprehensive development, for example, like technical knowledge skills, uh, skill of arts, culture and traditions, update news information, also the friendship and also linking the Lao youth with another youth in the region as well. So this is one of the platforms that we are here today that allow youth uh, will be the gateway for, for allow us to come here and see all of uh, other delegates here. And the approach is come up from the imaginations uh, and then we further to the study, organizing building, building and also lastly for the vocational creation. The youth also in, uh, contribute a lot to the national economic development also as well as some of the uh, uh, society works, for example, like educational responsibility, inclusive society and also effective manpower. And also we have this, the, some of the uh, scheme for the uh, enhancing the youth leadership in the country as well, right? So um, the youth contribution to ASEAN, we have the international level um, and also the regional level as well. For example, like poverty eradication is one of the national agenda of the government that allow youth to participate in this one. Yeah, for the next one is about the private sector development, also. Uh, youth are also participating in this one by engaging the business and the community in local by creating jobs for the local people. And we will further see some of the youth activity through the picture of the uh, uh, social work. Some of the brat donation, for example, also come up from the youth or even help the school in the outside area. And also the um, youth also participating in organizing some of the uh, Focal events, for example, at the ASEAN Submit, for example. And also one of the uh, mandate of the youth is we have the Young Entrepreneur Association of Laos. Okay. Yep. So the Young, uh, young Entrepreneur of Laos, we are uh, gathering all the young entrepreneurs in Laos uh, to how to, they can they move forward together by creating the job for the local people. And also we have the membership, uh, the member of the Young Entrepreneur of Laos received the youth award in 2017 as well. Okay. Right. So um, to better knowing about Laos, we have a short video for you, and then we, you can know better about Laos in, in, in brief. Yes, please. I didn't think it was possible. There's something about you that is intriguingly captivating. I can just feel the blood rushing through my veins.
So that's all for our presentations, and we hopefully that you um, know more about Laos. And as the slogan of the video, finally found Laos, finally found love. If you are uh, looking for love, go to Laos. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Now we have the last presentation of this session. Uh, I request the uh, delegates from Malaysia to please come on the dais and make their presentation. Hello, okay. A very good morning, Selamat pagi to every one of you. Uh, my name is Sarika, I'm a delegate from Malaysia, and here is my friend Fidaus, and today we will be presenting about our country. So it has been such an honor and privilege to have the opportunity to talk about our country in such a prestigious venue. So thank you so much for that opportunity. So first of all, Malaysia, this is our flag, and this is the map of Malaysia, as you all know. Uh, we are bordering with Thailand, Singapore, Brunei, and also Indonesia. And just want to reiterate on the... Next slide. Just want to reiterate on some of the facts that which you all already have known. Our capital city would be Kuala Lumpur and how our administration is um, in Putrajaya. So uh, Malaysia is uh, quite a huge country with 13 states, and now we have three federal territories. Our population has been increasing day by day, and now we are standing at the 32 million of this year. And uh, uh, as you all know, our country is, con is a multiracial country. You have Malays, you have Indians, Chinese, Sikhs, and many other people living in a harmoniously in our country. So our currency is ringgit. So just want to recap on the history. So basically, Malaysia has uh, origins from Malay, Malay Kingdom, and which eventually became subject to the British Empire. So British came, they conquered Malaysia, and then afterwards, we kind of worked towards to get independence. So first of all, we were unified as Malayan Union. Then we became the Federation of Malaya. Then we united with North Borneo, which is currently Sabah and Sarawak. And later on, Singapore decided to leave us. So, so yeah, now we are Malaysia. So just want to recap on the political structure. Uh, because we were, as a consequence of being um, conquered by British, our government system basically follows the Westminster parliamentary system. So our legal system naturally also follows the common law system, which, has been, uh, which is also the same as India. So when we are doing our legal research, so if there is no precedence in our country, Malaysia, we tend to look for English cases and also Indian cases. Our Malaysian contract law is actually modeled after the Indian contract law. So that comes in really handy because we have like more cases to look at. Um, our country's head of the state is the king, which is chosen from the nine Malay states and it's um, for every five years. But although the head of the country is the Agong, we also have the head of the government, which is the prime minister. Our country's official language is Master Malaysia, but however, if you come to our country, every one of us are able to speak in English because English has been an active second language in our country. We are taught in schools, in, even in universities. So we like to take this opportunity to actually speak about our prime minister. So in the current, the most recent general election, so Tun M was, the, was elected as our seventh prime minister of Malaysia. He, I mean, we are very proud to announce that he is the current oldest world leader at staggering 93 years old. In fact, he was a practicing doctor before entering into politics, and he was the father of modernization. Like before this, I showed you the picture of KLCC. Those are his brainchild. KLCC, Putrajaya, and our smart tunnel, everything was his uh, brainchild. Before this, he was also our fourth prime minister, and he has been in office for a very long time. He has been uh, the minister of education, the defense minister, and deputy prime minister, so he is really 
like an amazing human being, very down to earth, and now he's, you know, working so hard at 93 years old. Oh, I'm not sure whether you can see this clearly, but just want to reiterate how our export, Malaysians export mainly would be rubber, palm oil, um, electronic and electric products, and petroleum mainly. And our big export, we, we export most of our stuff to um, Singapore, Thailand, India, and Vietnam. And our export set, uh, India is the seventh largest exporting country, and we have like 36 billion generated from India alone. So now I'll pass the floor to my friend Fidaus to continue. All right, moving to uh, move on to sport. Actually, uh, football is the main uh, sport in Malaysia. Everybody looks, uh, likes football in Malaysia, uh, especially men. They, they play even from, from the beginning, from the early childhood until you have academy for that. And right now, under the Ministry, Minister of, uh, Ministry of Youth and, and uh, Sports, that was uh, led by uh, YB Said Sadiq, our youngest federal minister in Malaysia. Uh, we come to eSports and we're preparing for uh, SEA Games Philippines 2019. Okay, as you can see also, as you can see, uh, we, have also, we also have a queen of squash here, Dato Nicole David. Uh, uh, on the right is uh, Dato Lee Chong Wei, the king of badminton from Malaysia. We, not to forget, we also have a best athlete for Paralympic, even break the world record for 100 meter uh, Paralympic event. Okay, we also have a uh, international facility and one of it uh, is National Velodrome of Malaysia that uh, there is located at Nilai Negeri Sembilan. Okay, we move on to cultural heritage. Okay, as, as Ms. Sarika said just now, we are multiracial uh, countries. We have uh, lots of races here in Malaysia uh, like Sikh, Malay, Chinese and Indian. And we have also have uh, the indige indigenous people from Sabah and Sarawak, such as uh, Kadazan Dusun, Iban, Murud, Melanau, Bidayo, uh, Bajau, and lots of others. We have uh, more than 100 ethnic ethnicity, especially in Sabah and Sarawak. Okay, we, we come to food. Everyone, everyone likes food, right? Okay, <laughs> same, same as uh, Malaysian because of the, the, the different cultures. Uh, different races of Malaysia, we have a lot of food and typically this is typical food uh, that Malaysians take. Uh, for breakfast, we used to take roti canai and nasi lemak, uh, banana leaf rice and nasi lemak, uh, nasi ayam for uh, dinner, uh, for, sorry, for lunch and I let you guess what we take for dinner. What do we take for dinner? <laughs> Alright, no, we take McDonald's. Okay, <laughs> so so we 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 comes with a lot of uh because of the multiracial we also uh, assimilate with the westerners like, with, with the western uh, food as well for dinner for McDonald's KFC and so on. All right, for Malaysian for tourism we focus on uh, we focus for two tourism uh, types which is uh, eco tourism and cultural tourism. As you can see, eco eco tourism is mainly uh, located at the Sabah Sarawak lah because of the because of the uh, topo topographic there, like Mount Kinabalu, Sipadan Island, Bohe Dulang, as well as uh, Rawa Island and Pretian Islands located at the Semenanjung or at the west of Malaysia. All right, you can come. I, I, I suggest you to come to Malaysia to visit the ecotourism. <laughs> All right, for uh, cultural tourism, we have it here at uh, Langkawi, uh, free duty of chocolate. If you like chocolates, come to Langkawi. All right, uh, Selangor State Mosque, Pink Mosque of Putrajaya, Batu Cave for during uh, this is very popular during, especially during Thai Pusam Day, uh, and also Sleeping Buddha in Penang. All right, we're talking about connectivity uh, between Malaysia and India. We actually have connected a uh, long time ago, and this is one of the uh, examples. And this is uh, Bujang Valley, and the, even the word Bujang. Uh, means serpent. So this is uh, Malaysia, Malaya, before, before, long time ago, lah, before we become Malaysia, Hindu, Hindu Buddhist uh, was dominant in Malaysia. After that, 
the traders from Arab come to Straits of Malacca, and now the uh, majority of the Malaysia are Muslim. All right. Okay, this is uh, the pol in, in terms of political ties, we are also uh, very uh, stronger tie with uh, India. As you can see here, our beloved Prime Minister, uh, Tun Dr. Mahathir, made the uh, Prime Minister of India right after the election uh, last year. All right. Uh, for economic relation, we have, uh, as you can see here, we have 12, 240 flights from Kuala Lumpur to India and India to Kuala Lumpur. And also, we are among the first country to sign MOU with India after the Cold War in 1993. And we also provide free visa for uh, Indian citizens uh, to come to Malaysia. I'm mean, proud to have that with you. All right. Uh, and also, last year, 2018, we receive 1% uh, of, 1 of uh, Malaysian uh, visit to India, around uh, 300,000 uh, from population of Malaysia. All right. In terms of education as well, uh, we have uh, 30... Can I have the next slide, please? Oh, that, all right. In terms of education, over 30% doctors in India, in Malaysia, sorry, were educated uh, in India, and we have proud that India can uh, actually serve for these uh, educations. All right, uh, as a, we are with the spirit of Malaysian, we, uh, we end our slide with thank you. Thank you. Terima, terima kasih. Kasi, 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 and Mandarin. So, uh, thank you once again to all the uh, five country delegates who made their presentation. Now, we will immediately begin with the next session, uh, the panel discussion on economic connectivity.